Well, it's Easter, and there's one New Testament character that we really should give attention to because he's often neglected. But in fact, he's someone who reveals a great deal about the fabrication of the Jesus yarn. The man we all know as Judas. This is the disciple that went bad and sold out his Lord. Heaven forbid. Before looking at the role of Judas, let's first look at his name. Judas is in fact a Greek rendering of the Hebrew Yehuda, or as we might say in English, Judah, or sometimes Jude. No one can fail to notice the similarity of the word Jude or Judah to Jew, for good reason. The first Judah appears in the book of Genesis. He is the fourth of the twelve sons of Jacob, and supposedly founder of the tribe of Judah, which became the kingdom of David. The thing we may all remember about the early Judah is that he sold his brother Joseph, yes, that's the one with the technicolored coat, to Arab traders for twenty pieces of silver. So the name Judas is loaded with dark meanings, linking in a word Jew and betrayal. Now, let's trace the character of the betrayer in the Jesus story. If we start with the earliest layer of material, the letters attributed to Paul, we find something interesting. There is no mention of Judas at all. Paul talks repeatedly about the crucified Christ, for sure, but he never once alludes to that familiar story of arrest, trial and execution. There is no Pontius Pilate, no Caiaphas, and there's no Judas. Paul, in 1 Corinthians, refers to the night that he was delivered up, and most modern Bibles substitute the word betrayed in this verse. But check any literal translation of the Greek. It actually refers to delivering up. It's merely been harmonized in modern translations to fit in with the later Gospels. The interesting thing here is who is doing the delivering up. It is God himself, just as God delivers up his suffering servant in the book of Isaiah, which no doubt inspired the writer of the Pauline epistle. And we only have to remember what the basic deal is here. Jesus has to die to redeem mankind from sin. It isn't an option depending on him being betrayed or not. And notice what is said in the much quoted list of resurrection appearances in 1 Corinthians. He rose again on the third day and was seen by Cephas and the Twelve. It doesn't say the Eleven. And yet, for those who wish to quibble, Matthias wasn't chosen as a substitute for Judas until 50 days later. Paul's epistles demonstrate something common to the very earliest Christian material, that there was at that stage no story of betrayal by a disciple. Mark's gospel is the first introduction to the Jesus story of a human betrayer. But notice that in Mark, the betrayal arrives out of the blue. Mark provides no motive for the treachery of Judas. Up until that point, Jesus has always included Judas among his faithful disciples. As for example, when he sends out his disciples two by two with the power to expel evil spirits. He actually calls Peter, not Judas, Satan when Peter objects to his intended self-sacrifice. In chapter 10 of Mark, it's the brothers James and John, not Judas, who are chided for asking for top seats in heaven. And in Matthew 19, Jesus even tells the assembled disciples that they would judge the twelve tribes of Israel seated on twelve thrones in heaven, and that number twelve included Judas. The author of Matthew could see the problems with the lack of motives in Mark's tale, so he provides one himself, greed. He has Judas approach the chief priests and ask how much he would be given to deliver up Jesus. The price is set at 30 pieces of silver. This supposedly is sufficient to corrupt the hand-picked disciple who has seen him perform miracles and given him the power over evil spirits. 
Luke isn't happy with Matthew's solution, so he opts for something rather more powerful. Satan entered Judas. So now the hapless Judas is to be pitied rather than condemned. In fact, a number of early Christians actually regarded Judas as a hero, not a villain. If Jesus hadn't been crucified, no one would be saved. For example, the Gnostics, known as Cainites, honoured Judas for making the salvation of mankind possible. The instruction to Judas found in John 13, what you have to do, do quickly, led some early Christians to speculate that Jesus had himself conspired with Judas to bring about his necessary sacrifice. On this scenario, Judas was not in fact a betrayer, but the most faithful and enlightened of Jesus' disciples the very idea that runs through the Gospel of Judas, a manuscript as ancient as any other orthodox text. The author of John, decades later, addressed these weaknesses in the treatment of Judas by naming and shaming Judas wherever he could. He decides that Judas was not just greedy, but was a thief who, despite being in the presence of the most prescient being who ever lived, was put in charge of the collective money bag and helped himself whenever he fancied. John decides to edit the anointing at Bethany scene from the other Gospels, where all the disciples object to the waste of precious ointment by identifying that it was Judas alone who was the hypocritical objector to the waste. As if that was not enough, at the Last Supper not only does John have Satan enter Judas, he has Jesus identify him as the betrayer with a piece of dunked bread. Matthew and Luke can't even agree on the demise of Judas. Matthew has him return his blood money and hang himself, and the priests buy the potter's field. Luke, in Acts, has him buy the field himself and burst open. But then Matthew is borrowing from 2 Samuel, where a traitor to David hangs himself, whereas Luke has taken his inspiration from Psalm 109. It may be scripture, but it isn't true. It isn't history. It's just more astounding rubbish.